Happy Sabbath. Good to see you all today. Our message today is entitled Beyond Black Friday, but I chose such a dark font for my middle word there that it didn't show up, so I'm going to have to change my slides. There we go. Okay, that's better. Uh, Question for you today, you don't have to raise your hand for this one, but did you do it? Did you get up at the crack of dawn yesterday morning, fight all the Sunday morning, I mean uh, Friday morning traffic, Sunday morning traffic's pretty chill out here in Salt Lake City for some reason, fight that Friday morning traffic, get in line, I did it once, I got a ping pong table at Walmart. I almost died. It was dangerous. I, I did finally go. I, I, I went late yesterday afternoon, just enough before sundown that I wasn't treading on the edges, but a, a friend of mine called me from uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and asked me to go find something for him at my local sporting goods store. And I, I went on down there, and uh, the parking lot was just so packed. There were cars parking in places where cars never park. And finally, I found a spot next to a snowplow. You know how scary it is to park your car next to a snowplow? The big blade sticking out, they're all jagged. And, and I went on in, and the store was just crawling with people. And, and I looked around at all the different items that, that uh, I had been on my wish list, so to speak, and, and I noticed the prices were the same. I hadn't changed any, and, and I walked up to one of the salesmen there that I'd, I'd worked with before, and I said, so, so where are the sales? I mean, this place is crowded with people, but I don't see any different prices than we had last time. He goes, no, it's just Black Friday. And I said a silent prayer for him and told him, I you know, hoped that he would have a wonderful, uh, survive the rest of his day. And uh, he said, yeah, thanks. And... <laughs> and uh, and that was it. That was my, that was my Black Friday experience. Um, you know, Black Friday, I think, is becoming something like this. I saw this meme on social media, and I think this describes it pretty well. Wednesday, $8.99.99. Thursday, $8.99.99. Black Friday, $8.99. Marked down from $1,099.99, right? And you see, the, of course, the Braveheart characters finally says, okay, now's the time to go for it. I think that's what Black Friday has become. It's, it's become something like that, um, where the prices don't change. It's just your mentality it changes. This is the day. I got to get it on Black Friday, right? I've got to. Well, this may not seem to have anything to do with Black Friday, but it, it might if you know the story. And this is a, a verse, Jesus' own words from Luke chapter 17, verses 32 through 33. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. We'll get back to that one here in a little bit, but I just wanted to share that with you because, first of all, we've got to, it's, it's, it's almost, it's after Thanksgiving, so that means we have to do a Christmas story, right? It's Christmas, it's Christmas, see, we're at Christmas all month. Yes, so here's our Christmas story for today. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And there's something I want you to notice about Simeon, and that is Simeon was waiting for something. He was waiting for something quite specific. In fact, he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, this is written by Luke as, as, as he tells the story, and he knows that his audience knows exactly what he means. When he says consolation of Israel. Because Israel has, has been living amidst loss since, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian Empire. They've been living as strangers in a strange land, or, or even when they're home, they're living under oppression, and they're, they're living under the heavy thumb of tyranny. And they long for consolation. And I really believe that when Luke writes this and and describes this part of the story, I I really believe this is the verse that he has in mind. If you have your real Bibles with you, go ahead and look it up. Isaiah chapter 40, uh, starting with verse 1, it says this, comfort, comfort 
my people. Or you may know it as comfort, comfort ye my people, right? Like, hey, isn't that in a song somewhere? Yeah, it is. Comfort my people, says, the, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Of course, Handel took these words and crafted them into the powerful music that we know as the Messiah. Comfort, tender speaking, crying for joy that her warfare is ended, iniquity pardoned. That's what Simeon was looking for that day, this righteous and devout man as he arrived at the temple for his duties that day. Notice what else Isaiah has to proclaim. Behold your God, but behold the Lord God comes with might, and he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are young. God is coming. And he's going to tend, he's going to gather, he's going to carry, and he's, he will gently lead. That's what Simeon's looking for that day. That is the consolation, of the, 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 the consolation that he seeks as the Holy Spirit leads him that day. So, Luke goes on. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. There, Luke kind of helps fill in the blank for us. This consolation, this hope, this promise, the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, he took him up in his arms, blessed God, And said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation of the Gentiles. And for the glory to your people, Israel. Simeon has fulfilled his bucket list. He's seen the thing that he he longed to see his entire life. He finally has seen it. He's not only seen it, he's held it in his arms. I love the song that Michael Card writes about this. Now that I've held him in my arms. (laughs) Now that I've held him in my arms. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And yet, as, as Luke tells us this part of the story and, 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 and shows us that there's someone who recognizes the Messiah in his infancy when he first shows up, Luke also tells us later on in his gospel that there are many who don't recognize the Messiah even after he's been working with them for 30-some years. Notice this from Luke chapter 17. Being asked by the Pharisees, When the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. Again, on day eight, Simeon knew that the kingdom of God had come. As he held that child in his arms, he knew this is the kingdom of God. And yet Jesus, who is the king, is unrecognized by the Pharisees. He's unrecognized by the most religious people in the community, those who have been studying their Bibles. Of course, Simeon, he'd been studying his Bible too, but it was the Holy Spirit that helped him to decipher what the Scriptures even meant. By the Holy Spirit, he was able to recognize. If you've got the king, if he's here present, if you can hold the king in your arms, you have the kingdom. Jesus says this, he says, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. That's kind of odd, isn't it? (laughs) Up until now, Jesus has healed all kinds of people. Healed a woman, healed a man on the Sabbath. Healed ten lepers right before this story. Cured leprosy, unheard of. Restores these ten men. 
And Jesus says the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Really? You can't see that? I get a feeling that as Jesus says this to them, he's saying the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed by you. That you're not going to recognize it. It's, it's not going to fit your paradigm. It's not going to match how you expect things to go down. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. <laughs> it's not necessarily some phenomenon, some, some completed act, something that you will see finally in an instant fulfilled, and there it is. It's something that happens gradually. But then he says this, the kingdom of God, and I love this translation of this verse, is in the midst of you. I think that's the most accurate way to render this verse. Not among you in some kind of esoteric, nebulous kind of a way, but as he stands there in the presence of those Pharisees and says, in the midst of you, he's saying, look around the circle here, you know, amongst the, anybody that's gathered in this place, somewhere in this circle is the kingdom of God. Standing here with you, in your midst, take a guess. Who do you think it is? What's fascinating is they don't get it. And as often happens in the gospel story, we find a private conversation between Jesus and his disciples where he pulls them aside and says, look, this is how it's going to go down. The days are coming. Even for you, my disciples, the days are coming where, where you're not going to be so sure. You're going to desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You're, you're going to desire to see that day when ten lepers were healed, or a blind man received his sight, or a woman was healed after 18 years of suffering. You're going to want to see that day, but you won't see it. You'll be a little Pharisee like yourself. You'll, you'll long to see it, but you won't be able to see it. They'll say to you, look there or look here. Don't go follow them. Don't go follow them. You know, there, there is a dynamic, and it's a very real dynamic in every church I have ever pastored. And probably in a lot of the churches I haven't pastored. I've got two pastors here today, friends of mine from college, that could probably vouch for me on this one. And that is the harder a pastor tries to let Jesus Christ be the head of the church, the more people sense a power vacuum within that church. Because if a pastor decides to let Jesus be the head of the church, then the pastor is stepping down from that role. And when a pastor steps down from that role, there's a power vacuum that's perceived. We need leadership around here. Somebody's got to be in charge. And it's very natural for someone to say, you know what, I think I, I've lived here a lot longer than he has anyway. I think I... You run things around here. My pastor friends are nodding their heads. They're like, yeah, I think I've seen that somewhere before. And Jesus is saying this to his disciples. He's saying, you know, you don't have the kingdom if you don't have the king, but there's going to come a time in the history of the Christian church. A time is going to come where you'll want to see the days of the Son of Man. He's speaking, of course, ahead of time. He's, he's talking about his ascension and when he's going to be physically gone from them and he's going to say, you're going to want to see me present. You're going to want to see my power, but you won't see it. And when that happens, people will try to fill the void. They're going to say, hey, look, there's a, here's a new sensation over here. I think this is going to meet all our needs and give us everything we want. This is our Black Friday special. Line up and get it while you can. Or look, here, over here, this is it. This is the answer. This is the solution to all of our problems. And Jesus says, do not go out or follow them. And then he says this famous verse. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. You'll know when it's me. You'll know when I show up. But first, son of man character, he must suffer many things. Be rejected. He'll be rejected by this generation. He's talking about the people of his time. But it's true of our time too, amen?
It's true of our time too. And then the very next thing that Jesus says in this part of the story is this incredible verse. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Remember the story about Lot and his family and the place where they lived. You know, the place where Lot and his family lived is very interesting because it looks a lot like the place where we live. Had a salt sea. Lot and his family lived in the picture on your left. They had a salt sea. In fact, even in the bottom there, you can see they're mining salt. They, they kind of create these little shallow places where... Does that look familiar? And then north of the Salt Sea, there's a freshwater river called the Jordan River. Does that ring any bells? Except it's south, right? And then a little lake, a freshwater lake called the Sea of Galilee. And here's our own Salt Lake area, a salt lake, a river called Jordan, sort of a freshwater lake. Utah Lake's got problems. <laughs> Pray for Utah Lake. It's in trouble. But it's amazing that Lot and his family lived in a place a lot like ours, a booming city with all kinds of amazing things going on. As you look at this picture, though, and the one on the left, any guesses where Sodom was right about where that arrow's pointing right there, they guess. In the salt mine is where salt, Sodom, we think, was. Why do we say was when we talk about Sodom? Well, because a day came where God visited that city. He first, first visited that city with messengers and said, you know what? <laughs> Something's going to happen. Something's going to change. You're going to have to relocate. And as they were leaving, or I should say this, let's take a look at this part of the story. Just as it was in the days of Lot, Jesus says, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. That's how it was. They were eating and drinking. You know, they were having Thanksgiving dinners. They were buying and selling. They had Black Friday. They were planting and they were building. And then it goes on, but on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. Amen. Now that I've cheered you all up, let's go eat. Yeah. <laughs> and then Jesus says this, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, we first read this, and we read it through the lens of saying, okay, so Jesus is saying, when I show up, <laughs> it's going to be fire and brimstone, and there's going to be destruction. And we find many other scriptures that help to validate that that is actually, unfortunately, part of the story. But I want to show you something. This word revealed is apocalypto. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is apocalypto. It will be an apocalyptic day, but we always misread that word because we read that, misread that word based upon how it's been applied by the movie industry and by all kinds of other storytellers who, who take that word and say this, this word that we borrow from the book of Revelation in our English language we think of apocalypse, we think of the end of the world, we think of everything burning and everything miserable and everything horrible and this, this incredibly shocking, horrifying demise. But even the book of Revelation begins with the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And the word means unveiling. The, the word means revelation, revealing. Revealing what? The beasts? Scary monsters? Terrifying into the world? 
No, revealing Jesus. So look at this story again. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Revealed. When Jesus shows up, when Jesus is revealed, you realize that you don't need anything else. As Lot and his family left the city of Sodom, the goal was for them to realize that they didn't need anything else. Notice how Jesus tells the story on that day. Let the one who is on the housetops with his goods in the house not come down. Take them away. <laughs> if that day happens, you need to realize something. Now, this could be interpreted two different ways, right? You don't have time to go down and get your stuff because fire is going to rain down from heaven. True. But it's also true that on the day when that happens, you're not going to need the stuff in your house. Anybody with me today? When that happens, you're not going to need the stuff. Even if you had time, you're not going to need it. Likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. You're not going to need it. Remember, Lot's wife, because the rest of the story is that as they flee the city, Lot's wife turns around and looks back. And we wonder, there's all kinds of guesses as to why she looks back. Does she just want to see the City Creek Mall one more time? I mean, that's a great mall. Black Friday specials. She looks back, and we wonder, what was her problem? I think it's this. I think her problem was that she was thinking too much about Christmas presents, and she was not conscious of the Christmas presence. She wasn't conscious of the reality that when you're, when you're led out of your city by Almighty God, you have everything you need. There's nothing to look back for. It's not, you know, did we leave the refrigerator open? And sometimes my wife and I, we sit in the car in the driveway before we go on a trip. We just stay in the car for a while. And we think. You know, it saves a lot of gas. You know, you just sit in the car and you think. Do you turn the oven off? Do we close the fridge? Do we have the dog? No, Watsons have the dog. Okay. We're good, yeah. Watsons are cheering. Yay! Make sure you got everything. This time... They need nothing. They need nothing. All they need is the presence. The God who's leading them out, the, the God who's taking them from this place. It's all they need. Just remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. And then Jesus, in case we didn't understand it, in case we didn't get what he was talking about, he, he fills in the gap and he says this. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. 